little bit about your background and what type of work you specialise in? I certainly will, yeah. Um, I'm a writer and I'm fascinated by various phenomena such as near-death experience, out-of-body experiences, uh, shamanic experiences, and also applying the neurological aspects to it as well, of understanding exactly what's happening in the brain. I'm also intrigued and fascinated by how we can apply quantum physics to consciousness, mm -hmm. and indeed the ongoing mystery of exactly what consciousness is. Because you know it's one of these great mysteries, as David Chalmers, the Australian philosopher, has said, it's the hard problem. How does inanimate matter bring about this consciousness aware conscious awareness we have of the the world around us? You know, our memories, our anticipations, love, hate, these mm -hmm. kind of things. They're all very human characteristics, and they don't exist outside there in the external world. They're internal things. And something wanted me to just take a year out and write a book. Yeah. It was really weird, it was this overpowering sensation, but I had no idea what I was going to write about. And literally, I, on the first morning, I sat in front of the computer going, what am I going to write about? And what happened, it's really weird. What happened was, I started to get a, a migraine attack. Now, I, I, my, I have classic migraine. When the migraine started to attack, one of the things that people who have classic migraine will be aware of is that a classic migraine you, you, you don't necessarily have a headache. You have a very, very strong aura sensation yeah. where you sense that the migraine is going to happen. Now, with me, I get tingling in my lips uh, and, I, and my fingers start to feel a little bit numb. That's the warning that it's coming it's on. It's the warning it's coming. And I know, and then I start to, to lose sight. I get what's called a scotoma, a white light, which starts to make me partially blind. But as this was happening, there is another phenomenon that is also allied to the, the, uh, the, the aura state. And that's deja vu sensations. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing was, I was sitting in front of the computer screen, and suddenly I had the most alarming deja vu that I'd done this before. That I'd sat in front of that very computer screen, looking out over my home, which was then in Horsham in West Sussex, mm -hmm. looking out over the same scene. And when the, the, the aura stopped, and I came back to what I would call normal reality, when the doors of perception, as we were discussing earlier, closed slightly, I thought that's my subject matter. I'll write about deja vu. And that's what I did. I started writing a book about deja vu because I started to research it and I found that at that time there'd only been two or three books that had been written on the subject. A guy called Vernon Nepe had written a book um, on deja vu um, and another guy called Dr. Arthur Funkhauser, who is an American who lives in Switzerland, yeah. he'd written one or two papers on the dream theory of deja vu. And I just started to get into it from there, and I thought, well, I can take an interesting angle here. And what I then found was I was moving into neurology, because I found that deja vu, or deja vecu as it technically is. But what then happened was that I started to make the links between deja vu and art's hypothesis. And art's hypothesis is that a deja vu sensation is the feeling that you have, you are recognizing the circumstances because you have experienced them before in a dream. So you had a dream a few days ago, which you've forgotten, which has gone into your, your, your memory bank. Enfoldment. The unfoldment, which is the David Bone, which we'll talk, touch on as well. And what happens is you start to live the dream. You know, as, as David Ames, the, uh, the Tom Cruise character, says in Vanilla Sky, I'm living the dream, I'm living the dream. And you start to live the dream, and the recognition starts to kick in where you start to think, I've done this before. But what intrigued me and what intrigued art at the time as well was, but that doesn't explain how the dream can be precognitive because effectively what you're doing is you are recognizing events before they happen the shadow of the event yes yeah, so or the shadow or the, the, the back in time mm -hmm. as you approach it you know you start to sense the feelings of it and I, I contacted art on this and art art is art by training as a physicist and we again debated this and I said but art you're implying precognition here which there is no scientific model within modern science to explain precognition so I then moved on and I found that there is a particular neurotransmitter in the brain that seems to stimulate and, and, and causes migraine, and it's called glutamate. Now, I then found that glutamate is also responsible for something called temporal lobe epilepsy, which is epilepsy that's focused on the temporal lobes, which are the areas around yeah. the ears. And then the weirdest thing happened, and this is genuinely true, it was the oddest thing. I got, I got a phone call. I was sitting in my, my, my place in Horsham, and I got a phone call, and it's from an agency. And the lady in the agency, I always call her Margaret, just to, 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 um, to ensure that people don't actually know who she is, because she's a very private lady, and it's not further than yeah. I mention this, so I always call her Margaret. 
And Margaret rang me and she said, uh, Tony, I've got a job for you. Would you be interested in taking a contract? And I said, no, because I'm, I'm writing a book. And she said, well, what are you writing about? Because people always do their interest in what you're writing about. And I said, well, I don't really know at the moment. So I've gone from deja vu into precognition. And now I'm into temporal lobe epilepsy. And she went really quiet. And she said, we need to speak. So I arranged to meet up with her. Um, we went for coffee in a hotel near Gatwick Airport. And she turned up and she sat down in front of me and she goes, the reason I needed to speak to you was that I've recently been diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. And she said, everything you were describing, I have experienced. So, so I you said, had a walk and case study there, Absolutely. Didn't yeah. It was wonderful because here I had somebody who was going to give me from the experience's point of view. Mm-hmm. And she turned around and she said, I, said, I asked her and I said, how did you first know that you had uh, temporal lobe epilepsy or TLE? And she said, it was the strangest experience of my life. And after she told me what happened to her, it was the most amazing experience of my life because it sent the book in a totally different direction. Because what she said was that she was at work or she was, she was with a client in a, in a cantina, in a, in, a, in a company. And as her friend was about to pour a cup of tea, she spent a snap over her ear. And her friend was like this. And she thought, why is she... And she's looking, she goes, why is she stopped moving? And she could hear this low humming sound around her. And then she looked around the room and everybody was frozen. Now again, I referenced the movie uh, Vanilla Sky. There's a sequence in Vanilla Sky where this happens. And she's looking around and then she looks at her friend and she notices she's moving incredibly slowly. And she watched for hour after hour as the tea came out. So and she stopped into time then, didn't she? she fell out of time and, she, and I, she said something very significant to me. She said, I could have been there for years. I could have been in that state for a lifetime. And she said, I've no idea how long I was there. But then, then there was a snap and my friend continued moving and then back. She said, are you all right? She'd had a temporal lobe absence, petty male absence, and as far as her friend was concerned, all she'd done is she'd gone like that. That's all the friend had seen. That's all the friend had seen. But there's something about epilepsy which is close to something spiritual. Totally. There's something called Waxman-Gershwin syndrome. And Waxman-Gershwin is um, a a, a part of um, temporal lobe epilepsy, or temporal lobe epileptics have it, where they become hyper-religious. Mm-hmm. And it's not hyper-religious, it's hyper-spiritual, because what they see is they see connections where we don't see them. Yeah. For instance, classic writers like Dostoevsky. If you read Dostoevsky, for instance, there's a section in, I think it's The Idiot, where Dostoevsky... Change Mishkin, isn't it? And Mish- Mishkin, 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 yeah. And Mishkin himself goes on about his disease. But in The Idiot, Mishkin, I think it's Mishkin, gets arrested and they, they, give a mock, they do a mock execution. Mm. And while this is happening... Maishkin goes into this kind of falling out of time, or the character falls out of time, and, and was able, has enough time to count all the, the slates on the church opposite. Now, the interesting thing is, that actually happened to Dostoevsky. That was a real incident. Mm-hmm. It was part of something called the Petrovsky Circle, which tried to assassinate Tsar Alexander II, I think it was. And he went through a mock execution. And when he did this, he had this experience, which again is what Margaret had. Now, what is intriguing is that I then said to Margaret, do you get deja vu sensations? And she said, my God, I get deja vu sensations to kill for. When I'm in my pre-seizure aura state, I know what's going to happen for the next four or five minutes. And I said to her, well, if you know that, why don't you say something? And this is something that's been repeated by the many, many temporal lobe epileptics that have now contacted me. Mm-hmm. When they have these deja vu sensations, they've all said the same thing. They say, if I say something, I will change the future. In other words, if I'm having a, a deja vu sensation now and I know what you're going to say next, mm-hmm. if I turn around to you and say, Margie, I know what you're going to say next, you won't say it. Yeah, it's so suddenly, Yeah, so suddenly I've changed the future. And, and as that made me think and thought, well, are there alternate futures out there and we follow one path or another path? You know, so I started then reading up about the Emberit's Many Worlds interpretation of particle physics. And I started to... I then realised that there's a massive linkage with another phenomenon, and glutamate is linked to this. But glutamate itself is the major neurotransmitter of the mammalian brain. It's a chemical, a neurotransmitter is a chemical that that is generated at the end of what's called the synaptic gap. 
And what it does is it fires, the, the signal comes down to the end of the neuron, the brain cell, and then depending upon what, what, the, the, what needs to happen is what chemical is it fired uses, across the gap. Yeah. And at the other side of the gap, there are little, for want of better things, like little harbour places that are shaped in particular ways, like a lock into a key. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the neurotransmitters go over to the receptor cells and they send messages across the brain. Now, glutamate is responsible. Glutamate brings about, when it floods, particularly the temporal lobes, it brings about migraine, brings about temporal lobe epilepsy. It's also responsible for bipolar disorder. But the weirdest thing is, we all will have a temporal lobe seizure at one point in our lives, and that's the point of death, because the brain floods with glutamate at the point of death. The near-death experience. So that near-death experience is a bit like what your friend experienced she just was, before she went into correct. the... She was yeah. having a near-death experience, and when people have petty mal seizures, when they, when they have temporal lobe seizures, they are having tiny near-death experiences. Now, people who have had near-death experiences, when they come back from the near-death experience, what do they report? They report time slowed down. Mm -hmm. In fact, you talk to people who are involved in car crashes. The amount of times, somebody told me recently she fell off a horse. She said, I was falling off the horse for about an hour. Well, acting's like that, time slows down. Again, it's yeah. the same, isn't it? It's because what's happening, you're stressed. Mm -hmm. And it, you're using stress positively. And stre it is known that when you're stressed, you generate glutamate in the brain. Mm -hmm. Now, what else glutamate does is it also generates out-of-the-body experiences and sensations of feeling outside of your body. And again, Temple of Epileptics report this. There's a guy called Ramachandran. And Ramachandran has written a book about unusual brain states. And he discusses people who have temporal lobe epilepsy and he discusses people who have various other odd brain states, as does Oliver Sacks, the writer, as well. Yeah. And if you join this all together, what you see is, is that a near-death experience, something very curious happens. So the person falls out of time. Now, how many times in near-death experiences do you hear people turn around and say, my life flashed before my eyes? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, this is intriguing. My life flashed before my eyes. I wonder if in a real death experience, what happened to Margaret happens to us all, yeah. i.e. the glutamate slows down our perception of time. So at the final seconds of your life, you fall out of time. And you could be there forever. And this is the interesting thing. <laughs> In a near-death experience, people turn around and say, my life flashed before my eyes. Imagine the scenario in a real death experience that it doesn't flash. It's not fast-forwarded. You go bang, back to the point of your birth and you start to relive your life in a three-dimensional matrix-like recreation of your life. I then got into it and I thought, is there any evidence that the human brain remembers everything? I found it. Tons of material about this. For instance, not many people know this, but we receive reality. You're processing reality now. You're looking at me, you're taking in the sounds and everything else. In order to make everything simultaneous, the human brain buffers things. It's like the classic example, I don't know if you know, when you hear a car door slam, mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever noticed, if the car is further away than 80, 80 meters, the car door slamming and the sound aren't simultaneous. But under 80 meters, they are simultaneous, even though the sound takes longer to get to you Stretched than the light. It. So what the brain does, it waits until it gets all the information, it buffers it and then presents it so we have this feeling. Like when it gathers on a video, yes. that type of buffering. Yeah, yeah like buffering and the computer, where the computer buffers information before it presents it, okay? Yeah. Now, if this is the case, it means the human brain is recording things, because you can only buffer information if it's recorded. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into this and I found a guy called Wilder Penfield, who was an American neurosurgeon in the, from the 1930s to the 1950s, and Penfield was able to reproduce past life memories, three-dimensional past life memories in people, by placing an electrode onto the exposed temporal lobes of conscious patients. This clearly to me is evidence that the temporal lobes are crucial to all this, but also that the human brain records everything, and I think it records it holographically. Well, I'm fascinated by that because the first time I got onto that idea and principle, through the computer, you know, it was never anything that was taught to us at school, but I came across the Akashic Records. Yes. And when I started to, um, to read about the Akashic Records, that basically everything is recorded. The Hindus, I think they were the first they were, to yes. bring up the Akashic Record. And I was explaining it to my son, and my son said, oh, that's just belief. 
And yeah, it's about that fractal idea. Yes, the Mandelbrot set and the way everything repeats and repeats and repeats. And goes into that enfoldment, that yeah, curve. Yeah, that curved yeah. idea. Now, you might be intrigued by this, is that I've been offered and have accepted a research fellowship at the Centre for Advanced Studies at Gorodino Bruno University, which is run by, run by a guy called Professor Irvin Laszlo. Now, Laszlo has written the most amazing book called Science and the Akashic Record. Now, what yeah. Laszlo suggests, and I write about this in my, le my next book, which is out in November, that Laszlo argues, and the science is very accurate, is that at the very, very, at the almost just above absolute zero, which I think is 272, minus 272.4 mm -hmm. degrees Celsius, I think. And at that point, it seems that the atoms, or the, the subatomic particles, the actual, the, 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 the nucleus, the, the electrons and everything else, they seem to be able to draw energy from somewhere else. And modern scientists are arguing that there is something called the zero point field and zero point energy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a company in, Col in, in Colorado that has recently got an American patent to try and draw up this zero point energy as an energy source. This is the Akasha. This is the Akashic yeah. record. This is where all the information lies. So every single incident in our lives, everything we record mentally, everything we perceive, everything everybody on the planet perceives, is effectively downloaded into the zero point field, which is like a huge computer program. You know, it's like, it's a huge first person computer simulation. That and we everything's on the hard drive. Everything it? equivalent, it's on the hard drive. Now again, there's an American writer called Dr. Uh, uh, Tom Campbell, and Tom Campbell has written a trilogy of books called My Big Toe, and in this he does. He's the an science. American fella, isn't he? Is he, he is American? Tom. Yeah, because yeah. I've heard him on Red Ice with yourself. Yeah, it was a very good interview. It's well worth catching that interview I did with Tom, uh, and in fact I My did. My Big Toe. My Big Toe, wonderful. <laughs> now the interesting thing Great is, expression. and this is again a coincidence. Tom's idea, My Big Toe, is grand theory of everything. It's my grand theory of everything. Believe it or not, I have a big toe as well. Yeah, you've done one, haven't you? Yeah, and yeah. my big toe is, I suggest that this kind of matrix-like illusion of reality that people fall into at the moment of death, I call the Bohmian IMAX. Great name. Now, I don't know if the background to that is, I don't know if you know, but um, a guy called Daniel Dennett, who's a philosopher, came up with a concept he called the Cartesian Theatre which is based upon uh, Descartes and Descartes' idea of, I think, that for I yeah. am. And what he says is the Cartesian theatre is the idea that somewhere inside your head is a little homunculus, a little Margie that sits there. Like, remember <laughs> the numbskulls when we were kids in the yeah. comic? There's a little version of Margie there with a TV camera in front of her and a little sound system, and she listens to everything. <laughs> the problem is with that, you get an infinite regress because in that little Margie's head, there must be another little homunculus sitting there with a TV set. And on it repeats and repeats. It repeats and it goes back, uh, it goes back on itself. And Daniel Dennett says, so therefore the Cartesian theatre doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But what I've done is I've taken his idea and I've said, it's not a Cartesian theatre, it's a Bohmian IMAX. Because David Bohm, Professor David Bohm, came up with this wonderful hypothesis which he called enfoldment. And he said that there's the implicate order, which is the deeper level of reality, where everything is enfolded on itself holographically. Yeah. And out of that implicate order becomes what's called the expl ex explicate order, which is the reality we perceive. And it's generated by the brain. And I think, uh, and I'm, I'm very fascinated by this, I even know, I think, how it's generated. It's generated by objects called microtubules, which are inside the, each of the neurons of the brain. And if you go into there, there's something called Einstein, Einstein Bose condensates. And these are the most weird substances, and they're inside our brains. There's also an argument that the human brain, as is everywhere, is full of trillions and trillions of tiny black holes. You know, in terms of black holes, there's no particular reason why they should be a particular size. Now, if there are these tiny little black holes everywhere at the lowest level of reality in terms of size, it could be that consciousness could be sucked into those black holes because consciousness <coughs> is non-physical. And of course, if a physical object is sucked into a black hole, it gets torn to pieces because of the gravity. Well, that's that worry over the hydrogen collider, isn't it? The large CERN. hydrogen collider in CERN. Is yeah. that that um, experiment can produce millions Mini, of millions little of black mini black holes. holes? And of course, <laughs> what they're looking there for is something called the Higgs boson. And to define the Higgs boson, it then means that they've got the God particle, isn't it's the it? The God part. The God particle is the thing they're looking for, and and the Higgs boson is linked into the God particle, and the idea of the God particle, the idea of the ultimate particle we've been looking for. We've 
Marcus Chan wrote uh, one, of, one, of, one of my people I know. Marcus wrote this wonderful book called The Particle Zoo. And with this, what is happening in since, since the 1960s, every time scientists think about a subatomic particle, they find it. Richard Feynman, one of the world's greatest particle physicists of the late 20th century, came to the conclusion that what was happening was we were creating these particles by thinking about them. You know, we think about them and they happen, which of course in particle physics is exactly what does happen. It's the about Copenhagen viewing it, isn't it? Because it doesn't exist if you don't view it. Exactly. If you, it's something called the twin slit experiment. And the idea is that light is, is either a photon, which is a point particle, or it is a wave which is smeared out. They have... Every time they do experiments where they put a measuring device to look at these things to say whether they're particles or waves, if somebody's looking at them, they're a particle. But if they're not looked at and they're not measured, they're a wave. And it happens every time. So they respond to you in a way. It's as if the particles... Two-way relationship. Yeah, it's as if the particles know they're being observed and they're reacting to the act of observation. <laughs> now, if this is the case, now, if we think, and they found that this happens with electrons, and it happens with atoms, yeah. and it happens with molecules, they put something called a buckyball, which is a huge molecule, and they found that this has wave-particle duality. Everything you see around you is made up of molecules, mm -hmm. and molecules are brought into existence by the act of observation of a conscious mind. This is going back to Maya, it's what the, the Hindus believe, that we bring the world into existence by the act of observation. So in other words, if, we turn, if I turn away from you now, within my own worldview, you've gone back to being a wave, and I look at you and all your little particles are called collapsing, all your particles collapse and you become marking. And the only reason that you continue is because you're being looked at by the camera, and you're being looked at by everybody else in the room, so you continue. But in my world, you cease to exist when I look away from you. Well, isn't it in interesting that, you know, all the things that we've, the path that we've followed, and the, the ideas and the stories about our spiritual power, consciousness being expanded, is now got a great support system by science. Oh, totally. And you're, you know, one of the first to come out with that for us, you know, is to, to pinpoint that it's not airy-fairy, there's actually quantum physics in there. It annoys me a great, great deal because what happens is you'll get people who will turn around and they're still very stuck in the scientific paradigm of 110 years ago. Mm. Because 110 years ago there were various scientists who said, we know everything there is to know about the universe, we only need a few more decimal points. There were only two or three dark things on the horizon. One was called black body radiation and another one was called the photoelectric effect. Mm -hmm. And both these things were black swans. They didn't fit in with the science as they had black it. Black swans? Black swans. Black swans are, it's a term I use, it's not an original one, but a black swan is something that doesn't fit. Because what happened was, I think it was around about the, the, the 18th, 18th century sometime, all the swans in Europe are white. And nobody ever thought that a black swan could ever exist. And they found black swans in Australia. So the idea of a black swan is something that is a clue to a deeper reality. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the black swans at that time were with a photoelectric effect, which is the idea that when you shine a light beam onto a, an object, it seems that electrons were being kicked out of the surface. Now, if light was a wave, it shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. And they believe light was a wave. But of course, Einstein came along and said, in, in, in his initial paper, I think in 1903, and said, well, if light was a particle, the particles are hitting the surface and kicking the electrons out. Suddenly everything changed. So suddenly the first black swan. The first black swan. And the second one, which was even more intriguing, which I think happened in 1901, was the problem of black body radiation. And without getting technical about this, it's the idea, is energy continual? In other words, is there a continual line of energy? And there were certain things that they perceived that implied they couldn't be. And they didn't know what was happening. And a guy called Max Planck came along and said, I can solve this. If energy is not continual, but comes in little packets, so you get bump and then another it's packet, and another packet. And he called the packets, the Latin for package is quanta. And this is where quantum physics comes oh. from. So he said everything was in packages. Suddenly, it worked. Suddenly, they could explain back body radiation. But suddenly, they found that an awful lot of the things they believed about uh, the physics of the time, the Newtonian physics, suddenly didn't work anymore. At the super small, they found things that didn't make sense. For instance, people use the term quantum leaping all the time. Most people not, 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 haven't got a clue what that means. It means, as you probably know, theoretically, there's the nucleus of, of an atom, and whizzing round are electrons in, in orbits. 
like the planets going around the sun. I mean, that's an analogy they use. It's not quite right, but it's an analogy they use, and that seems to work. Quantum leaping is when an electron moves from one orbit to the other. And when it moves from one orbit to the other, if it goes to a lower state, it has to give off an ele- a, a photon of light. Mm-hmm. It has to get rid of energy so it can go into a lower state of energy. And this is light we see. Everything we see that's light is just photon, is, is electrons moving down and giving off light. That's what the sun does all the time. Mm-hmm. The thing is that the electron doesn't move. People would logically conclude the electron would move through the space. It's rather like I'm driving a car on South Circular in London. And if I want to get to the M25, I have to drive various roads to get to it. This is not what happens with the electron. What it does is it disappears. So it's like a car disappears on the South Circular and bang, instantaneously reappears on the M25. And this is what electrons are doing all the time. This is what helps us see everything. Mm -hmm. This is impossible. It doesn't cross the intervening does space. It, does it carry the information for us? You know, we're in particular times now where everything has opened up. The consciousness is there for everyone and the expansion of that consciousness is coming through in, in the particles. It is. The, well, there is an argument to say, you know, are particles intelligent? You know, I know it sounds Have they got a strange. mind of their own? Have they got a mind of their own? <laughs> now, there is a concept called panpsychism, and pan- panpsychism suggests that everything at different levels is conscious. Because what are we? We are an amalgamation. Effectively, you and I are a collection of, 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 of atoms and, and elements and everything else that started in the stars. We're stardust. But that stardust is inanimate. Mm-hmm. But when you put the stardust together, you suddenly start to generate organic compounds and organic molecules and everything else. But those organic molecules are not sentient, they're not conscious. Mm-hmm. But put them all together into an animal, and suddenly they become conscious of their environment. Mm-hmm. Then take them into a human being, and then they're not only conscious, but they are self-conscious. In other words, they are conscious of the fact that they are aware. So in which case, how does all this inanimate stuff bring about consciousness? Mm-hmm. And again, David Chalmers said this is the hard problem. And until modern science looks at this conundrum, they have to realise that like 1901, we are in the same position now. There are areas... You're trying in, to say that science has ended, or it's reached what, a plateau. It's reached a plateau, and what I'm thinking is, and if you read some of the books on particle physics these days, it is Miku Kaku and people like that, and David Deutsch, mm-hmm. people like that that deal with the many worlds interpretation of particle physics, and Max Tegmark. These guys are all saying the same thing. All new stars, you know, using all the new rock stars. Other the scientists, uh, exactly. yourself included, or, what you're yeah. doing, what um, Michu Kaku's doing, what David Icke's doing, well, bringing all this information to us. Well, what we're doing is what we're saying is look, guys, reality is far more mysterious and far more exciting than you can ever mm. imagine. You know, again, Richard Feynman once was quoted as saying, you know, in terms of don't try to understand what is happening in particle physics because nobody understands because we don't have the mental capacity to understand that an object can be a particle and a wave at the same time. We, we can't model Get our these heads ideas. Around that, yeah. Just like time, you know, is time linear? Well, in the quantum world, there's no linear time. It can go backwards and forwards. So it's like a lotus leaf, isn't it? Well, the lotus leaf is the intriguing thing. The lotus leaf and, and the lotus leaf and the pineal gland. You know, the, the shape you of the do, lotus. You do a lot of work about the pineal gland. I do. And the, the mirror in the brain, everything's repeated, and there's only one part of the brain that isn't repeated, and that's that magic gland just yeah, there. The pineal gland, and the pineal gland is the only thing that's not repeated. And as well as that, in my latest book, I'm suggesting a model whereby the pineal gland generates endogenous, that is, internally generated DMT, dimethyltryptyline. Your very own. <laughs> yeah, your very own DMT. And in fact, there's a guy in America called Beach Barrett who's been working on this, and he's given it a name. He calls it me- metatonin because it's a trip. It's 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 an amine. It's like melatonin, but metatonin. Metatonin, yeah. There's melatonin. Melatonin is the the sleep drug. Yeah. It's the sleep neurotransmitter that when it gets dark, you want to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And this is what causes um, sleep paralysis. Because what happens is the melatonin is released in the brain. But I argue, well, I don't argue, other people have argued and I write about it, that at the same time, metatonin is also generated by the pineal gland, which means that you are awake but asleep. 
So you can be in this kind of it's wake altered sleep state. state. It's an altered state of consciousness, technically known as hypnagogia or hypnopompia. These kind of what they call liminal states. That really. you've induced it. Yeah, and you can. And the thing is, if you model, if you can get yourself into these hypnagogic states, you can you can travel. You can lucid dream. You can mm -hmm. manipulate your dreams. You can astral travel. You can remote view. You, you can remote should... view. And the, the idea of all these things, again, in my next book, I deal with these, and I generate a model that is scientific that could explain how these seemingly inexplicable things within modern science can work. It's the idea, if there is an Akashic record out there, if it is that the human brain is a receiver of information... And a transmitter. And a transmitter. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're doing is there's a form of energy out there, and it could be the Akasha, whatever we want to term it. But modern science needs to wake up to these things and stop pretending that they know all the answers. Well, for you, your daemon has brought you here. Okay, the, da the daemon as a word has quite an interesting history in that it goes back to the ancient Greek beliefs that we have two elements to our psychology, which is not the same as the soul, which is something different, which they used to call psyche. Mm -hmm. um, but the daemon is a being that we are given at the moment of our birth and carries through our lives like a guardian angel. Our everyday self is called the Eidolon, which, which comes from the root word for idol, which is the same kind of thing, you know, like a graven image. And they considered that there were, there were two elements to us, but the daemon guides us through our lives. Now, the one thing that the ancient Greeks never explained was how it was that this daemon knows how to guide us. And I think I'm the first writer to come up with a proposition as to how the daemon can do this. Because the Romans then took on the idea, and they called it the genius. Mm -hmm. So again, when somebody says, you know, that I have my genius with me, the genius, again, is your guardian angel, your spirit guide. Or an artist could call it the muse. Or the muse is the same yeah. token. And in fact, that's why I suggest that my daemon manifested itself and has been for, for years, because it's been building me up to write this book. Now, what I suggest, the reason that the word daemon became de demon, literally demonized, was that the first century Christians um, didn't like the idea of the, the Greek mysteries. So they literally took the word daemon and demonized it and turned mm -hmm. it into demon. But that's why I use the word daemon because it's specifically very different concept to a demon. Mm -hmm. You know, a daemon is, 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 is a being in its own right. Mm -hmm. And it, it, is, it is neutral. Because people argue and say to me, well, what about Hitler's daemon? Because there was the classic case, you know, in the Staffenberg plot, when Hitler got up, and I don't know if you know, but his foot kicked the bomb. The bomb ended up behind a pillar, and when the bomb came, went off. It injured him, but it didn't kill him. Done his arm, didn't it? Yeah, which means that the daemon must have known, and the daemon kicked it to save his life. Now, that daemon was presumably an evil daemon, because the daemon is morally ambivalent. It just looks after its idol. Mm -hmm. So we all have daemons in here, and our daemons will just look after us. Now, so is it ego-related slightly? Slightly. I mean, effectively, the, the, the Jungian point of view of the anima and the animus which is the, 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 the Jungian archetypes, it's very, very similar. In fact, uh, Jung towards, uh, had his own daemon, he called him Philemon. And if you read up about Jung, you will find that Jung was very much going the same, down the same routes as I was, it's just he didn't quite do the science like I do. So the daemon, what I suggest is, you know when we're in this Bohmian IMAX, and we're living our lives again, there is part of us that remembers the fact we lived this life before, and this is your daemon. Mm -hmm. So at the point of death, the, the human consciousness splits into two. And you become, your aid, your daemon becomes self-aware because in your very first life, when you live your virgin life, when you record everything, you, you're a unitary being. So at the end of that life, that your daemon suddenly realizes that it's independent of you, mm -hmm. but part of you. So when you start living your second life, it remembers it's, and it's going, what's happening here? What am I supposed to do? But what it does is it, it suddenly realises, well, I know what, what Margie did last time round. Now, depending upon how open the communication channels are between your daemon and your yeah. Eidolon, is whether the daemon can say to you, Margie, don't do this. I use the analogy, it's like you're driving in a car and you're, you're, the, the Eidolon is driving the car. The daemon is sitting in the passenger seat. It can't change the route, it can't do anything, but it can talk to you yeah. and it can go, hey, Margie, don't do this. Now, it might whisper in your ear, it might try to talk to you in dreams, it might try to give you inklings and feelings that mm -hmm. things are wrong. But what it does is, it changes your life route. Now, people will say to me, well, if I'm living in a three-dimensional recreation of my life, how can it change? I can't change a movie I watch. 
Yeah. But it's not a movie. It's a three-dimensional computer game. First-person computer game that every single alternative has been programmed into the game via the Akashic record. Every permutation? Every permutation is there. It's all in there. So you follow. It's like uh, what Borges called the Garden of the Forking Paths, the idea that you can go in one route or another. Parallel worlds. This is where parallel worlds come in. This is where whoever at the third concept comes in, that the universe splits into copies of itself. They, they've expanded this now. I think old Dieter, a guy called Dieter Zay has come forward with something called the Many Minds Interpretation, which is that there are trillions of Margies. And one, with collectively, they will have all lived a life that collectively they will have recorded onto the Akashic Record mm-hmm. that will, con- will have within it all well, the alternatives of every decision. It's interesting that because recently I did Celebrity MasterChef. And I'm not a cook. I'm just a man cook, you know, eggs, chips and beans. But I thought, okay, my name's down for it. I'm going to give it my best shot. And there I was on the set. And what we had to produce was a sticky toffee pudding with butterscotch sauce. Okay. <laughs> and, well, how am I going to do this? And my Damon went into the Akashic record. I'd never... I'd never made a sticky toffee pudding before and I'd certainly had never attempted butterscotch sauce. (laughs) And this was all on camera. I made the biggest mess in the world. You've never seen it. It was like a Jackson Pollock pudding. (laughs) But somehow... Jackson Pollock pudding. It was a Jackson Pollock pudding. Somehow I went into that field of knowing and I was forced there because I was afraid, you know, and because... I had to produce something. My muse, my Damon, went into the Akashic Record and brought out the best sticky toffee button you've ever seen in all your life. Did you win? I won that round. Wow. I won that, and it was the sticky toffee button that did it. And even though everything was a total mess, I managed to be, produce this really dainty cake. And I thought about that after it was thought, Margie, where did you get that from? Because I'm not a cook, I'm not a chef. And yet I was able to go in there. And it happens with acting too. I think I, I told you about this before. You're doing a play. And um, I used to always think about method acting. And especially American actors, they're big on method, which is saying, I am 100% the character, the part. And I had a hard time with that. I thought, no, you can't be 100% the character because who's driving the car? Yeah? Yeah. Like you said, it's a passenger next to you. It may may not be driving the car, but it's advising you, it's talking to you. Well, something similar happens in the acting, where you've sent the characters out front, yeah? You know, two of you are playing, me and you, our characters are out there doing the biz. Behind that, I'm saying to you, did you have a bevy last night? Yeah. (laughs) So there's separation. And that separation's interesting. Margie, myself, always goes with the character. You can't get rid of you because it's the self that says that light isn't working properly. I've missed the cue. So it's not a complete 100% ownership of the character. Your daemon goes with you. Or, you know, you go with the character. So it's interesting that it comes out through art. You can understand... It's the, 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 one of the easiest ways to understand the daemon and that approach is through art because it depicts it well for you there. It does. One of the things in the, the daemon, the book, I have lots of examples of, of artists and writers and poets, people like Shelley and various other individuals, all of whom in different ways consider that they have a muse, they have a guiding yeah. principle. Rudyard Kipling, for instance, um, actually called his, his, his muse the daemon. Mm-hmm. And this daemon had precognitive abilities. It used to suggest storylines to him. For instance, he wrote a book called The Old Men of Pevensey in a, in a book called Poop Corner, I think it was. And the daemon manifested itself and suggested that he write a story about Pevensey Castle during the Norman invasions. And the thing is with Kipling was that, as with most fiction writers, he managed to paint his characters into a corner and he couldn't get them out. They were <laughs> at the top of a tower and they were trapped. And what intriguingly happened, the daemon manifested itself and said, I'll tell you what you should do. Make out that there is a sea well in behind the wall of the tower. Your heroes find the wall, the old men, and they, 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 they go through the wall, 
break down the wall, and they, they climb down on those little boats, and they can go out into the moat and they can get away. And Kipling said to the Damon, yes, that's all well and good, but there isn't uh, a sea well in Pevensey Castle, particularly not the place I've po- po- placed them in the book. Around about 15 years later, there were excavations. They found the sea well in the room Incredible. he'd written. And he says in his book, Something Of Me, his autobiography, Kipling says, "How what was happening there? How did that something inside me know? Mm-hmm. It was like it was a joke. It was as if it was saying, you know, I'm just going to give you this little clue to show you that I've lived your life before. And if you start looking at these clues, and you know, with my, with my readership, my international readership, we do this all the time. Once you start to realise that your daemon's there and manifesting, you see the clues. You see the kind of the little hints. Is this how you can put it to good use now, now that you're aware? Yeah, because I can show you something. And this is the first time I've actually shown this on film. I've, to- I've talked about it a lot, but I've never actually mentioned it. Um, now, the things you need to know about me is that I never, ever dog ear book pages. It's something that I just don't do. I hate, you know, all my books are very important to me and I keep them You're in pristine. full respect to them, aren't you? Yeah, totally. I think books are incredibly important. Now, when I was doing research of the first version of the first book, It Lad, Is Their Life After Death, it was a much larger version and I went off into some many great interesting areas in terms of science. And one of the areas I even started going into was um, the, the, the structures of cells because I was quite interested in something called mitochondrial memory. A mitochondrial memory and mitochondrial DNA is a different form of DNA that's carried through the female line. Mm-hmm. So you can actually calculate somebody's back, background through the female line. Which, which is, is yeah, because it's provable through the female line. Yes, yes, and you can draw it back. Now I remembered when, um, and this was about 2001, and I thought, now who do I know that will have written about mitochondrial DNA? And I thought there's only one writer in my bookcase that will have done this, and this would be Richard Dawkins. Now, I have most of Richard Dawkins' books, and I had all of his books up until that stage. And I had read The Blind Watchmaker, which is this book here, Mm -hmm. around about eight years before, when I was on holiday in a a tiny Greek island called Simi, near near Turkey. And what I I remembered, I thought, yes, it was many years ago I read it. So I went to my bookcase, and this is the book that I had read on the beach in Greece. And as I looked at it, I noticed that one page had been dog-eared, mm. and I, I knew, my daemon flashed into my mind and went, clo, and I opened it, and the one page that's dog-eared is that one. Yeah. Now if you read down the page, you will see that I've highlighted one word, mitochondria. If you go to the back of the book, it is the only time that Richard Dawkins at that time had mentioned mentioned mitochondria in any of his books. My earlier self, my subconscious daemon, had done it deliberately. It it had turned round and it said, I'm going to leave you a clue to show you you're on the right route by writing. So eight years, nine years, seven years before, it just goes like that, which I've never done before, and I closed the book and I went up and I had a beer. That was one of the things that made me believe that whatever I was going, I was on the right track. And since then, if you read my books, you'll know <coughs> that there were at least a dozen of those daemonic hints. And since then, they continue and they continue and continue. Are in you in, in better response to it? I listen to it more. Yeah. Now. I listen to the message. I listen to the, the hints and the feelings and the sensations. And I go with the flow far more than I used to. I don't fight it because the daemon knows the outcome of the outcome of the outcome of the actions. So therefore it will manipulate yourself into a situation that initially may not seem to be helpful, but you will find that from that situation will come something that will be helpful. And that's why we are finding now that people like you you and I are being drawn together, or there are other people from around the world who are coming to me, and and we have a section on my forum, and there's a section, how did you come across Anthony Peake's work? And people post in there how they pick my book up, go, come back, come back again, pick it up, look at it. Other times it's it's fallen off a bookcase in front of somebody. But the classic, and this is a really true story, one of the people on my forum is a top medium in in London. No, she's she's not from London, she lives in Wales, but she was down in London for an interview at the BBC. Is it okay to say who it is? Uh, No. Okay. No, it isn't. Uh, Again, it may look like I'm, but I'm... I'm Another Margaret. It, probably another model, <laughs> yeah. Um, but she was down in London to have an interview at the BBC, and she was on the tube train. 
and as she was on the tube train, a woman opposite stood up and had a bag, and she put the bag forward and a book fell out, and it landed between, like that, in front of the, the medium. She picked the book up, and it was my book, and she went to give it the woman back, and the woman said, no, that's for you, and got Ooh. off the train. And then she then started flicking through it, and she said she'd only read four books in her life, and she goes, oh my God, I've got to read this. She went upstairs, phoned the BBC and said, I'm not coming in today, there's something I must do, and she said she finished the book four o'clock the next morning, and she said it blew her mind. She said, you've explained every single thing that I've believed about my own mediumship. And this is the reason that I don't use her name, because mm -hmm. she claims that she has spirit guides. Yeah. But she's actually said to me that I don't have spirit guides. I have one voice, and this voice is my daemon. And whether I'm talking to dead people or whatever, I don't know. But I know that something talks to me and guides me. So I thought, you know, there's intriguing, those kind of stories. There is they something keep in coming the up, don't they? When, you, when things, when you are on the right path and you're doing what you're supposed to do, it falls into place easily. And it's like you're saying all these people now who are responding to your work, and you've been doing it for how long? It's 10 years? Well, the first book came out in 2006, and the second book in 2008. Um, but but your preparation for this has gone over a long period. But the preparation is a long period of time, and I think for most of my life I've been preparing for this. Why do you think that this awakening, you know, is really gathering pace? We're coming, we're almost at 2012. And that's a time where a lot of commentators are putting a lot of fear into the, um, the, the mass audience about it. Or there's some commentators, mainly like yourself, who are guiding people to a different understanding about what happens at that point in time in 2012. And for me, I'm interested in right now, where we are in this moment in time. And it's that thing about lots of people being drawn along the same idea, you know, that our consciousness has been expanded, our perceptions are far more bigger and detailed. Why is that happening? Okay. The reason, if you take my it lad model and you take what my overall concept, which is called cheating the ferryman, if you apply this, it is possible that the collective daemons in the world, i.e., the daemon of all daemons, the, 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 the collective consciousness, the zeitgeist, the weltgeist concept, is that if most of us are living our lives again, it means that most of us remember what happened in our lives last time. Mm -hmm. Which means, do we remember that something profoundly ha profound happened in 2012? And this is why people are starting to sense, you know, whether it's the Mayan or anything, who knows. But it seems that too many people are focusing in on this. And I think it's because each of our daemons knows that something is going to happen. Knows and, the school. Yeah, and the daemons are going, don't let it happen again. Mm -hmm. Please. The only way we're going to be able to do this is to manifest ourselves more in the lives of our Eidolons. And I just, I would like to believe, but it's vain, but I would like to believe that my books are going to be a tool for this. Because people are going to read the books and suddenly think, hmm, there's something scientific about this. It makes neurological sense. It makes rational sense. It makes logical sense without throwing away the science. In other words, you know, I can explain precognition by my cheating the ferryman hypothesis without, within science. Because if you're what you're living within a movie you've already watched, you know what's going to happen next because you've been in the movie. Mm -hmm. There's nothing magical about it. In fact, it's a memory. It's not the future at all. You can't, don't need to see the future because you've already existed in it. It's because we get the wrong concept of time. So all the daemons are screaming. It's a continuum, isn't it? Like yeah. So all the daemons are screaming and going, do something about it. Now, one or two people have said that there seems to be a link between me and 2012, and something that's kicking off at the moment is very, very weird, is this 11-11 prompt phenomenon. Now, because that keeps coming up. Oh, I've been looking on your Facebook, and the amount of coincidences, just personally for you, oh, with the 11-11 theme. You've done another book on it, haven't you? Well, no, no, no. This is the interesting thing. Now, this is the, the English version of Is There Life After Death? Yeah. Okay? Now, three years ago, Dutch, the Dutch version came out. Okay? And this is the Dutch version. Okay? Now, just look at the title of that book. Leven, na, leven, na, leven. So, 11, 11, 11 is the title of my Dutch book. 11, 11, 11 in Dutch is life after life after life. Do the daemons speak Dutch? <laughs> is the 11, 11 phenomenon a message to say life after life after life? 
And the reason that we're not seeing it at the moment is because we're seeing the 11-11 phenomenon as something else. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue that you could say that the reason people see 11-11, and I'm willing to accept this, is that they're all downstrokes. Now, the human mind, we are, we we'll are creatures. On the... Yeah, we're creatures that look for patterns. There's yeah. something called gestalt psychology. We look for patterns. We see patterns. We see face shapes. Yeah, we like it in clouds, and we yeah. like it in wallpaper. You know, and we're K, K. To... K. Bush's line, you know, that cloud up there looks like Ireland. <laughs> you know, the, 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 they, they, we do see shapes and things. And if you think about it, all other numbers don't have that downstroke. Mm-hmm. So it could be that when you're scanning a room and you see a digital readout, you're going to notice it. But the problem is that doesn't doesn't how these things are rooted. Eleven eleven comes up and it roots in different ways. It is a synchronistic thing, you know. It's significant. It's not just a coincidence. It's synchronistically based. Now other people turn around to me and say, "Oh well, I see seven seven and everything else." But it's eleven eleven. Now the irony on this is that a few months ago, um, I received two emails, one after the other, in my intray that came in. One from someone in England and one from somewhere in America. They were both from two writers. Both of those writers had written book on books on eleven eleven, and they came in immediately after each other in my in my intro. And again, it's things like that, and you think one of the ladies, she's travelling round the eleventh line of longitude around the world. The interesting, the final interesting thing on this is um, my next book is due out on either the tenth of the eleventh November or the 11th of <laughs> November 2011. <laughs> so my next book could come out on 11, 11, 11. Oh, I hope it does. And that wasn't planned. <laughs> but those synchronicities, you, there was another word that you were invented. Synchrondipity. And it's about coincidence and happy faith. Yeah, oh. synchrondipity is synchronicity and serendipity. Serendipity is, I don't know if you know the story, serendipity is the old name of Ceylon, the island. And when the Portuguese found it, they thought it was such a wonderful place, they called it fortuitously found, which is synchrondipity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, synchron... Uh, yeah, synchron... Uh, is so you... Seren- sorry, serendipity, I should yeah. say. I got that wrong. So it's serendipity and synchronicity. So I argue that there are certain coincidences and synchronicities that come together because they are giving you a message to help you find your way through mm. the maze of life. Yeah. And if you look at the synchrondipities... You find them everywhere. And in my Walker group in Liverpool, which you, you yeah, know, I remember of came along, great, pleased to went to we that. are finding that the, the, we sit there and the, the, the synchronicities that take place were just incredible. For instance, recently I had um, one of the guys that came along was Professor Sean Street, who is regularly on the BBC and everything, and he's a professor of media studies at Bournemouth University. And I was telling the story about a letter I had found belonged to J, sent to J.B. Priestley. And I won't go into detail, but it involved a plane crash in 1952 at the Farber Russia. Mm. And somebody had seen, had a dream about these events. As I'm telling the story to the collective group within the, the, the Walker group, and this is the kind of, because we have witnesses to these things as well, which makes it wonderful. Sean is sitting there with his mouth wide open. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with him? And he's going, I got talking to him afterwards. He said, I'm not gonna, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. He said, how many people do you think are still alive that would have been there in 1952 on that date seeing the plane crash? He said, I was there. I was six years wow. old. I was on my father's shoulders and I saw the plane crash. And not only that, but he'd done a TV, he'd done a radio program on it. And we just sat there and go, this is simply amazing. It means something. It comes I was putting on you there, but could you explain to us what your understanding is of the holographic universe? What does a hologram mean? Okay, a hologram... Holograms are things we see around, but they are very, very peculiar. um, In that, if you take a holographic image and you, you break it up into its integral parts, it's not like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, a jigsaw puzzle, you take a picture and you make it into a jigsaw puzzle, each bit of the picture is there. Yeah, it's with all ho- separate bits. It's all separate bits, whereas with a hologram, if you break a hologram up, each image contains the whole. So in which case you have a degraded image of the whole image. Mm. So in other words, it's an example of how something can be unfolded within itself. Yeah, that business of it like going round like a, on a shell, on a shell on the beach. Yes, like know, the conch. Yes. Things. Now, what happened was, and it was quite intriguing, was that I think it was probably in the early 1970s, a guy called Professor David Bohm was trying to understand, and Bohm had worked with Einstein, 
And in fact, F. David Peter, who is a local guy from around here but now lives in Italy, who's a, a, on my forum, he actually is the, the biographer of David Bowman. And yeah. he met Einstein. We got somebody on my forum wow. that met Einstein, <laughs> which is really great. But what Bohm said was that the only way you can explain certain subatomic particles the way they do things is the idea that each subatomic particle is in fact the same subatomic particle being looked at from a different angle. Different perspective. And a different perspective. Yeah. There's something called superposition. Uh, it's again called the, it's again the God particle. The idea that if you take two particles and you entangle them and then send them off in different directions and you do one thing to one, the other one will immediately react. This has been repeated time and time like again. Because they're like twins. They know it's like each they're other, twins. Yeah. They know each other. And the communication is instantaneous. What Einstein calls spooky action at a distance. And in fact, Einstein brought up a thought experiment called the Einstein-Rosen-Podolsky experiment, the EPR. And he suggested that this couldn't happen. But in 1981, a guy called Alain Aspect at uh, the Optical Institute in Paris did an experiment which proved that this is what does happen. Mm. But since then, a guy called Anton Zeilinger has been repeating these experiments time and time again, an Austrian guy. Yeah. And he's been sending entangled particles between the islands of the, of, um, the Canary Isles. And they sent two entangled particles different sides of the wall of China about 18 months ago. This is real groundbreaking stuff, and this is happening. You know, this is how quantum computers are going to work. But the thing is with entanglement, it suggests that at a deeper level of reality, what we see as two particles are just one, which means that every particle in the universe is just one. We're a huge that Unity hologram. consciousness again. Yeah. We are a huge hologram. Now, the fascinating thing is that another researcher called Carl Pribram at Georgetown University, at the same time, was trying to understand where memory is located in the brain. Now, he worked with a guy called Carl Lashley, and Lashley spent a long time working with rats, where he trained rats to go round a maze. Incredibly cruel, because what he'd do is then cut sections of the rat's brain out. But whatever sections of the rat's brain, the rat still found its way round the maze. So he came to the conclusion that he would never find what was called the engram, where memories are in the brain. Pribram started working, and Pribram said, I think I know how this works. Memory is a hologram. That's why the me that's why there isn't a common in the brain. It. Yeah, the brain it's... the brain works holographically. He contact and Pribram's son had read some David Bohm's work, and he contacted David Bohm, and suddenly the two of them, Pribram is saying the brain is a hologram, David Bohm is saying the universe is a hologram. a hologram. So we have a hologram generating a hologram. So suddenly <laughs> it's like rifting yourself up by your own bootstraps. Then you get the idea that the infinitely small is the infinitely huge. So you get again this reciprocal feeling that eternity is nothing to do with out there. And as William Blake said, to see heaven in a wild flower. And I believe that, for instance, in a teardrop, your teardrop contains the Milky Way galaxy. And in the Milky Way galaxy, <laughs> there is a version of you with a tear. And inside that tear is the Milky Way galaxy. And it just is like those Russian dolls. It's like when you put two mirrors together and it goes on. Well, it's quite a new idea, isn't it? I mean, I only got onto holograms the first um, noticed it when they put them onto credit cards and things yes. like that and that was when the first discussions come about holograms now we live in or our ideas have been up till this date more to do with the understanding of the pyramid shape where you know yeah. two at the top have all the information and right down to the bottom the um, the foundation stone don't have the information it's just the capstone that has it and because now we're getting an understanding of a holographic universe, that's supposed to be how the galactic setup, how ETs get here. Yeah, get here is by using that holographic system, and they use a holographic system, and we're old fashioned. We're still stuck with the pyramid. The idea of, of wormholes. You know, they, they could go through wormholes. There are, there are various things, the work I'm now doing with, with, with Laszlo and the associates, and the idea that human consciousness draws up this information from the zero point field yeah. using Einstein-Rosen bridges and um, Bose-Einstein condensates. The model works. And again, it's to do with holographic principles, and it's again to do microtubules are supposed to work holographically. Both both microtubules are the stuff inside a cell, aren't they? Yeah, microtubules are very, very small pieces of protein inside the neurons of the brain. They're very, very tiny. Is that what feeds the neurons in the brain? Yeah, and food? effectively, effectively, the argument with microtubules is they're so small that subatomic effects, 
like whether a particle decides to be a particle or a wave yeah. can actually affect the triggering of that microtubule. And if you have trillions of microtubules all being triggered by these things, it suddenly means that the way we perceive things changes. But as soon as we start to realise how nature works, you know, at the moment we're still stuck with this mechanistic model. We're still stuck with this idea that, you know, you push something and it moves or it will continue moving until it's stopped, you know, Newton's laws mm -hmm. of motion. But effectively, if you start looking at it in a subtly different way and realise, as Ernest Mack said, the, the great ph German philosopher scientist said, if there was only one object in the universe, how would you know it was moving? You couldn't, because everything moves culture. relative to everything else. Yeah. That's what relativity is all about. Movement is an illusion, and indeed, if, if there was no objects in space, and they disappeared, Space would cease to exist, because all spaces is the thing, the backdrop by which objects exist in. It's just that our brain processes distance, and this is again what um, um, Tom Campbell says, is that distance and um, length and breadth are all illusions created by the brain in order for us to make sense of all this. Now I also suggest that people who have temporal lobe epilepsy, the doors of perception are open, and they're seeing the holographic nature of the universe behind the universe. Schizophrenics, their doors of perception are wide open and they're seeing the whirls and swirls and everything else of the real mechanism of the universe. Mm -hmm. Like you see a holographic image when you don't put the right, the quite, the light, right laser light. You see it as swirls. It's only when the laser light illuminates it, when the light of consciousness illuminates the, 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 the hologram to create a three-dimensional reality. Move away, the, th the light of consciousness moves away, the three-dimensional reality becomes a holographic blur again. And we exist within this holographic blur. Schizophrenics see this and it drives them literally crazy because they're seeing reality it is. I read recently that um, Vincent van Gogh's painting, Starry, Starry Night, Mm -hmm. He was painting, I think it was cosmic waves or something of that nature, but that's what he was really perceiving. He was doing the wave and not the particle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Love it. Talking about when we say there is a reality that is non-quantifiable, that's not three-dimensional, you know, the idea well, is... Well, I can get onto it when you explain it like a computer, mm. because um, not that I'm a computer geek, I can click, you know, and that's good enough for me. I can't even cut and paste very well. But when you explain things to me about the interface of what's playing out in our mind is like the screen, you know? Yeah, yeah. And when you were explaining to me about the Akashic Records being the hard drive, yeah. well that makes it click, you get an understanding because it's what we're all using right now. And it's all, it's again, you know, down to binary code, you know, everything is is, is zero or one. But the idea is, you know, that everything is in formation, as Irvin Laszlo calls it, and the, the information is processed to create the three-dimensional reality that we see around us. In formation as in a pattern? Yeah, in yeah. formation. That's right, exactly. You've spotted it. You know, he's not using the word information. He is, but information is in formation. Yeah. And it's forming everything that we see around us. And our brains are the, the, the things that attune to that formation and the brains are what creates everything you know and this is something that philosophers have been debating for many many years I mean Henri Bergson who was a famous French philosopher over a hundred years ago was coming up with the idea that the human brain is an attenuator you know there's much more information out there it's just we our brain doesn't allow us to access it you know it's stopping us accessing the why do you think it does that because it could get overload it's overload yeah. total overload and effectively, if we saw the, the reality behind the reality, if we saw the... Like schizophrenics. Yeah, we saw the holographic nature of reality, we, we wouldn't be able to even equate or understand it. You know, we need to define things by other things. Yeah. You know, our universe, we, we use this by analogy of something is like this. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. And if we come across something that we have no analogy for, our language, and we are restricted by language, there's something called the wolf hypothesis, which says that our psychology and the way we perceive the world is modelled by our use of language. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very difficult to perceive things that we don't have a word for. Well, well then, you, you can't experience it, can you? Because no. that thing about dumbing people down, you know, um, shrinking the perceptions of things, if you haven't got the word, you can't understand 
the experience because you've got no language. And, and that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, when people have out-of-the-body experiences, when they have what's called noetic experiences, when they have what's called the oceanic feeling, you know, that sometimes you have that feeling of blissful happiness for a second, you'll see a sunset for a split second, you feel incredibly happy and you feel, I'm I'm right here, and this is where it's I need to be. It's amazing that feeling, isn't it? And it's called it your right up from your toes it does. and rise up to your head, and you go, "Oh, isn't this great being and alive?" Then you, being alive, <laughs> and then you lose it. And you know, the thing is, I, I'm reading at the moment um, various books by Peter Ospensky, the Russian philosopher, and Ospensky had that sensation in the Sea of Azov, where he he was sailing across the Sea of Azov, and he suddenly felt he was the sea, he was the the, the boat, he was the he was everything mm. around him. And this feeling of panpsychism, this feeling of, of I'm part of a greater something. I'm fooling myself into thinking I am Anthony Peake. I'm not. I, I am part of something far, far greater. And when I die, when I move on, when I get through the Bohemian IMAX and the many relives that I talk about in mm -hmm. my books, I will then move on and become pure energy and become part of the greater something. Well, you know, if you do get um, complete enlightenment, mm -hmm. you know, and um, what will you be with that enlightenment? You could pass over and become the spirit of another planet. You could be lots of things. It did. <laughs> because it's when you, when you think about it, you know, and it's something that it's on a starry night. You look up, and I've told you, you see about seven thousand stars. But on top of that, behind that, there are galaxies after millions and millions and millions of galaxies that go on as far as radio <laughs> telescopes and everything else can take us. Mm -hmm. What's it for? As somebody once said philosophically, surely, it's called the ontological argument, and it's the idea, surely it would be easier to have nothing than something. And why does something exist? And this is called the ontological argument for the existence of God, because the idea is, or, or a sentient something that brought this into existence, because things exist, where it would be easier for things not to exist. Um, I think it was Leibniz came up with that idea. But suffice to say, it is people don't think deeply enough about what's going on around them. You know, they don't think, why Do am they, I here? They get too scared of it. Totally. Yeah. Billy, Billy Butler says this to me all the time. You know, he'll sit there and he'll go, "Do you like? How do you? Do you? How do you sleep at night?" <laughs> and I sleep perfectly well because I I feel so excited and enlivened and enlightened by what I'm doing. Well, you're firing on all cylinders. You know, you're at middle stage in your life, and. You know, you're well aware of who your daemon is, and you've also got all that nono science around you, and you're right there at, at a peak, Anthony Peak. And that's I'm aware of that, that you're peaking at the minute. Maslow had a concept called a peak experience, and that is that these moments of enlightenment and everything else, and a lot of people have peaked peaked up on that, but picked up on that. It is pure coincidence. No. Well it's it's one of the one of my favourite quotations by um, Oscar Wilde, we may be in the gutter, but we're looking up at the stars. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great interview. Wonderful. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Classic.